We are finishing up this morning our study in the book of Ruth, um, and that is my fault. Um, I had planned to do four weeks in the book of Ruth, and last week got sidetracked reading over chapter three again and did an extra sermon that I wasn't planning on. And so, but this works out well um, because this is a story about the birth of a baby, and so it kind of fits into the whole Advent season time. And so, um, but next week we'll begin a, a couple week study on Advent as we um, enter into that season. But Ruth chapter 4, we'll finish this up this morning. Let me read from verses 13 down to verse 22. Ruth 4, 13 to 22. Um, and you're going to have to bear with me as I read these names. Last time I had to read a genealogy, one of the names sounded like a curse word, and they had to edit it out on the videos. And so if I mess up, um, forgive me. Um, don't hold that against me. Ruth 4.13. Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. He slept with her, and the Lord granted conception to her, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a family redeemer today. May his name be well known in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and became his nanny. The neighbor woman said a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the family records of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amidnadab. Amidnadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. So here we are at the last section in this fascinating study of Ruth. We started with a family that leaves Bethlehem, a city called Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And they look for food and shelter in a foreign country called Moab. Eventually, the dad dies, the two sons die. Eventually, while there, the two sons marry Moabite women, Ruth and, um, and Orpah. But eventually, the dad dies and the two sons die, leaving three widows, defenseless, homeless, in poverty. Having nothing left in Moab, Naomi, the mother, and one of the daughter-in-laws, Ruth, goes back to Bethlehem, where Ruth just happens to end up on the field of Boaz, who happens to be a kinsman redeemer, who happens to say, I will redeem you, who ends up doing what he promises. He ends up being a noble, God-fearing man that does whatever it takes to make sure that Ruth and Naomi are taken care of. And at the end of last week, we saw that Boaz was a man of his word. He ends up marrying Ruth, the Moabite, the outsider. And if the story ended right there, it would have been a phenomenal story in and of itself. But God wasn't interested in just giving us a story for the sake of showing off his creative writing skills. This was a story that is part of a bigger, grander story. And this morning, we get to see how this story ultimately ties into the great salvation story and the impact that this story has on each of our lives this morning. Those of you who are still around on social media, especially Facebook and Instagram, you know that there's nothing that gets more likes or more comments than when there's a change in status. Those of you who are or recently have gotten married, the moment you change your status from engaged or from single to engaged or from engaged to married, you started seeing all sorts of people liking your post, commenting on your post. Some of them, you didn't even realize they were friends of yours on Facebook. And it's amazing how delighted and excited people get when good news is being shared. Another example is when the birth of a child is announced. Announcing the birth of a child on Facebook has replaced birth announcements that used to come in the mail. But basically on Facebook, you get a picture of a child and you get these um, statements that basically says so-and-so was born on such-and-such a date and he weighed or he or she weighed this much pounds, usually um, between 8 and 10 pounds and was about this long, between 18 and 22 inches. And that's all there is on Facebook, a bunch of facts 
but it is like the most thrilling news ever. Why? Because a child who was eagerly anticipated for months has finally entered the world. And the announcement is even more thrilling when the child is a miracle baby, when the child is an answer to a prayer that a family has been praying for for maybe years or for a long, long time. This morning, our text is the gospel or the good news of the birth of a son. It's the birth announcement of a long-awaited, long-prayed-for, long-desired son, a son on whom the hopes of an entire family rests. This is a story about how both Ruth and Naomi had their lives changed by the birth of a son. But the differences between Ruth, whose life that was full of faith has defined everything about her, and Naomi, who has failed and struggled to trust God in some hard situations, will be beneficial for us. These two are bound together in love, but they experience life completely different. The Apostle Peter, when he was writing his second epistle, he closes his letter by making this statement. He says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's encouraging to know that we can grow in grace, that we can take steps that lead to maturity, that we can make decisions in our lives that form character, that become men and women of greater Christ-likeness. This morning's message is a message about grace. See, grace offers us this environment for growth. Grace offers us an opportunity to become more like Jesus. God honors the choices that we make, and we become the people we allow God to make us. See, this is a story of the life of Ruth and Boaz. They were apprehended by God and His grace early on, and they grew in grace. Verse 13 tells us how Ruth's story turned out. And it's not a surprise to us at all. What happens to her is what we should expect would happen to her. The wedding wasn't called off at the last minute. Boaz didn't have cold feet. Nothing unexpected happens at the end. The marriage take, pl takes place. Two lovebirds become parents. All, all of that was in line with their growth and grace. You know, there's a whole lot of talk about how do we become mature in our walk with Jesus? How do we grow in our walk with Jesus? But friends, maturity isn't an arbitrary stroke of luck that just happens to some people. It doesn't just randomly show up. It's always fascinating to me when people come and tell me that they aren't close to God or they don't experience His presence or um, they're, they're not really delighting um, in spending time with God, more often than not, when pressed in, if they're honest, you discover that it's been a long time since they spent personal time with Jesus. It's been a long time since they sat reading God's Word. It's been a long time since they really enjoyed being in community, not just showing up on a Sunday morning, but being in communities, reading God's Word. And it's not hard to figure out why they're not maturing, why they're not growing in their walk with Jesus, because these are things that the Bible says are the things that we're supposed to do to grow and walk in our walk with Jesus. There are things like, oh, the Bible, reading it is so boring. I get nothing out of it. I fall asleep when I'm reading it. Reading the Bible does nothing for me. Maybe you might be just be more interested in what Jesus can do for you instead of delighting in what he has already done for you and realizing how much he's already done for you, saying, you know what, Jesus, you have saved me, redeemed me. I want to spend time with you. Maybe you're sitting there saying, I've got to read the Bible, maybe because if I do this, then God will do something for me. Instead of saying, God, you've already done enough for me. I'm doing this because I want to delight in the one who saved me, redeemed me, rescued me. Maturity, see, comes out of a willingness to spend time with Jesus. Maturity comes out of a time of growing in his word, of speaking with Jesus, of being in community with Jesus. It comes out of a willingness to learn and follow Jesus to say, God, I will trust you and obey you 
yeah, sometimes this might seem boring, but your word says that this is good for me, that I will grow in this. And so whether I get nothing out of this today or not, I'm going to spend time in this word because ultimately I know that you are doing a work in me. Ultimately, I know that whether I feel it or not, you are doing something deeper inside of me. Trust, obey. See, this is what Ruth's story presents to us today and is, should be an encouragement to us. However, that's not the only way that grace takes over our life. Sometimes we're captured by grace. That's the story of Ruth. Sometimes God overtakes us with His grace and embraces us despite every effort we make to run from it. As fast as we run, God chases us faster. As stiff-necked, rebellious, fearful, and unstable as we are, God does not give up on us. On the one hand, we have the good news of a woman who grew in grace, and on the other hand, we have the good news of a woman who was captured by God's grace. And we're going to look at both of these women this morning in contrast. Them. First of all, we see that in this last section, there's only one verse that's devoted to Ruth, the main character of this entire story, and that's verse 13. And verse 13 makes five short statements about Ruth, one right after the other. Number one, Boaz took Ruth, marries Ruth. Number two, she became his wife. Number three, he went in with her. Number four, the Lord enabled her to conceive. And number five, she gave birth to a son. The first announcement was that Boaz took Ruth. Why would the author make that statement? The author is basically making it very clear to us that Ruth is able to leave her past behind. All this time, she was Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the outsider. She was Ruth the idolater. She was Ruth that didn't look like us or didn't talk like us or didn't follow our customs. She was the outsider. She marries, her husband dies, leaving herself to be a childless widow, a situation that ultimately lands her in poverty without anything at all. She was a foreigner. She was an outsider. She wasn't part of God's family. She didn't deserve any special treatment. She was the rejected one. She had a past that was filled with pain and sorrow and struggle. And Boaz, in one action, takes all of that away from her. Her past doesn't dominate her future. She leaves all of that behind and becomes the honored wife of an honorable man. She becomes the daughter of Israel, the grandmother of King David, and in the ancestry of King Jesus. Her past is no longer what defines her future. Boaz took her. Secondly, we're told that Boaz and Ruth are married. We hit on the story of the kinsman redeemer last week, but the Jewish custom, the Jewish law required that someone in the family was required to take care of a widow, to bring her into her, the home, give her an honored place there, and have her child so that the family name could continue. That's what the law required. We all know that there are things that we should do because we have to do it, not because we want to do it. The law doesn't require Boaz to be loving to Ruth. He wasn't even immediately, immediate family to Ruth. And even if it was required, he could have basically done this as a legal transaction. But that wasn't the case in this story. Boaz loved Ruth. She became his wife. And now she walks around the city, not as a beggar woman trying to make ends meet, but walking hand in hand with her redeemer and her lover. She was given the highest possible status in that community. He didn't just do the minimum of fulfilling the law. He did the maximum of embracing her. Listen, when God loved you and saved you, he didn't just do the minimum of just saying, okay, you're welcomed in. He says, now I lavish upon you everything that belongs to me. You are my son, my daughter. Everything that I have is yours. You are mine. He doesn't just do a legal transaction to redeem us from hell into heaven. He says, you are family. Number three, we're told that they're lovers. This is clear by the phrase that it says that they went in. He went into her. That may be obvious after all, they're married, right? That's what you're supposed to do after you're married. But the author points out that, points this out because we're supposed to think of them 
not simply as meeting a legal obligation, not simply going through the motions, but there was intimacy here. There was genuine love here. From Boaz to Ruth, from Ruth to Boaz, there was intimacy. And you're supposed to reflect on that considering the fact that he is an honorable man. She used to be an idolater. He was, in our story, faultless the entire story. She used to be a follower of other gods. He was in the family. She was a foreigner. There would have been no reason at all for Boaz to be in love with Ruth, and Ruth should have found no reason to experience love from Boaz. But when grace shows up, barriers are removed. Let's skip the fourth statement for a second, and we'll come back to that. Number five says, Ruth bore a child. This is the crescendo of the story. Boaz takes Ruth, they're married, they're intimate with one another, and have a child. It all fits into the progress that we've seen in Ruth and Boaz's life. God prepared them for each other. He brings them together. He teaches them to speak to one another. They took risks trusting Jesus, and he honored their risk-taking. The legacy is continued. The shame of being barren is removed. The city rejoices. The Lord is praised, and the story ends so beautifully. They bear a child. Let's go back to that fourth statement. It says, God was doing all these things. These two made their choices. They took all the actions. There were results that followed. But the one that was behind the scenes working, orchestrating the details of their lives was this infinite, almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful God. God was accomplishing his purposes when they didn't see it. God was accomplishing his purposes when they did see it. God was always working. And you know the name that is used for Yahweh? God here in this orchestrating every single detail. On a side note, let me mention it was God who enabled Ruth to conceive. We shouldn't overlook that fact. It was not routine. She had been married before and she didn't have a child. Boaz was an older man. It was not a given at all that they were going to have a baby. But God intervened in their lives. See, Ruth's story is the story of an individual that grew in grace. But let's look at Naomi's story. Scripture says right there that a baby was born also to Naomi. Do you remember her story? It requires a little bit more discussion. Ruth, Ruth, what happened was completely in line with everything that we expected to happen for her. But Naomi was struggling the entire story, wrestling with God, frustrated with God, managing God, measuring God, asking for help, refusing help. And yet at the end of the story, his son was born to her as well. And that's great news. It's fascinating to see that the author closes the book with the spotlight on Naomi holding her baby, holding her grandson. And the women in chapter 4 speak this blessing over Naomi that was the exact opposite of Naomi's own words in chapter 1. These are the same women that Naomi speaks to in chapter 1 in the exact same town, sitting in the exact same public square. When Naomi came back from Moab, she said, hey, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, but God has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Because the Lord has witnessed against me. The Almighty has afflicted me. And here we are at the end of the story. The same women are there. Now Naomi is quiet and the women are speaking. And the women speak to Naomi and listen to their words. It says, blessed is the God who has never left you. He never left you without a redeemer. You said his hand had gone forth from you. But Naomi, it never did. This child will be the restorer of life to you, and he will be the provider of your future, the sustainer of your old age. The boy will grow someday, and his grandmother will never have to worry about where she will have a home and who will take care of her. Her grandson, Obed, will sustain her in her future and be a life restorer in her present. You know, those of us who have kids, especially little kids, you know that there is Nothing more life-restoring, nothing more satisfying to your soul than seeing your kids just enjoy life and laugh and play. 
we were driving back from Arkansas yesterday, and our six-year-old decided to prank his mom on her phone and sends her this message uh, from my phone. And when the mom reads, he's like, what? And he just busts out laughing. I mean, it was, he laughs so hard that everyone else in the car starts laughing, right? Not, because, but we have no idea what, what he's laughing about. Right? And, he's, and it was just this joy. There's this joy because we see him happy, the rest of us get happy. It's funny, as much as we love delighting and seeing our kids, most of us know that the people who get the most thrill out of our children are not us, it's our grandparents. It's the grandparents, right? I mean, it's funny how everything that we would get in trouble for as kids, it's totally permissible for our kids, right? Um, Their demeanor changes. Their lives are full of joy, and there's this excitement to be around their grandchildren. Up until this point, Naomi's story was filled with darkness and bitterness and sadness and depression. And now there's this rays of light that are bursting through, and it comes in the form of this small, tiny baby. I love the speech that the women give to Naomi here in this passage. Do you hear what they're saying here? It says, Naomi, look at your past. It's not that you were just holding a baby now. It's not even knowing that one day that this baby will become a man. But all that time, you went around moping. All that time, you went around discouraged. All that time, you talked about how bitter you are, wanting to quit, wanting to accuse God, concluding that you are empty instead of full, claiming that God had forgotten you. All that time that you thought that God was against you, that people were against you. Do you know who was standing right beside you? The woman who was better than seven sons. And she didn't just show up at the end of the story to rescue you. She was there with you the entire time. She was there when your husband died. She was there when your children died, and she never left you through it all. When your husband died, she was there. When your son died, she was there. She loved you in the midst of it. She loved you on the road back, from, back to Bethlehem from Moab. She gleaned in the threshing floor to provide for you. She loved you every day. You wanted a man because you thought that salvation would come through a man, a son, a husband, a brother, somebody, because you thought life would be secure for you if a man would provide for you. But do you know what God did? He gave you a woman, and you couldn't even see it. She was better than seven sons would have been. God was there for you the entire time, and you missed it because you were putting God in this box and saying, this is how, God, you need to show up. Naomi, you missed the blessings of God because you couldn't open your eyes and see. So here's Naomi with this gift that God has given her in her hands, a life-restoring son, a future being provided for her, and she looks back at her past and she says, yes, God was good to me. Even in those times when it was hard and difficult, God was good to me. Naomi has nothing to say. Instead of complaining, instead of giving advice, instead of manipulating, instead of calling anyone to account, the story fades out with Naomi sitting there, holding her grandson with the biggest smile on her face. And for the first time in the entire story, she simply soaks in the goodness of God in her life. Back in verse 11 and verse 12, the men of the city pronounced a blessing over Boaz when he decides to become a kinsman redeemer. They proclaim, in essence, that may your house expand in Israel's history because of the righteous act that you are doing. And the women here proclaim to Naomi, Naomi, may this boy's name be famous in all of Israel. Friends, these prayers were answered in abundance. When the family tree is drawn out and we go through the generations that come from the family of Boaz and Ruth includes the greatest child of Abraham's line, the most remarkable king of Israel's history, David. Their son Obed had a son and they named him Jesse. And when Jesse grew up, another boy was born in Bethlehem, the eighth of Jesse's son. He almost becomes unnoticed by the family. No one remembers him when the prophet Samuel shows up. But God never forgot him. God had his eyes on him. The little shepherd boy, David, would become one of the most remarkable human beings in history. But it doesn't end there. The book of Ruth ends with a genealogy, almost like credits on a screen at the end of a movie. And if you can imagine the hearers of the story, 
as they are amazed at the story of an outsider being brought into the family of God, being married to the most honorable man in society. Imagine the shock on their faces when the story ends that this outsider is the grandmother to the greatest king in Israel. You might feel like your story has no significance. You might feel like you're not doing anything. But friends, you have no idea the picture of what God is doing in and through your life if you would just be obedient. Did Naomi know that her great-grandson was going to be the greatest king of Israel? Had no idea. She had no idea. Do you know the impact of you living faithfully for Jesus today will have? You have no idea. I told you my story. I grew up a pastor's kid, but the reason I came to Jesus was because in my high school, for four years, there was a girl with the same last name as me, not related to me at all, but she was in love with Jesus. To the point that in my junior year, I prayed to Jesus. I was like, God, you've got to get her away from me because she's driving me nuts or you've got to give me the joy that she has. And God, that weekend, brought me to my knees in the bathroom of my church where I gave my life to Jesus. This young lady has no idea that her faithfulness and obedience to Jesus has impacted the life of a man that he can now preach the gospel week in and week out. Friends, you might think your actions and your behaviors don't make a difference. But if you are faithfully obeying Jesus day in and day out, it could be the smallest of things. It could be feeding your children. It could be taking care of them. It could be reading them stories, praying over them. It could be being friendly to a um, waiter at the restaurant you go to. It could be saying a nice word to the cashier at the grocery store. It could be a simple act. You have no idea. I've shared this illustration before, but imagine... If you leave here this morning and you go to, now I'm just going to be a totally hypothetical situation, but you go and you're having restaurant at your favorite restaurant after, and you're eating and you just say, you know what, I'm going to be gracious to the waiter today. And in the process, you just say, hey, how can I pray for you? That person could totally say, I don't need your prayer. And that's totally fine. You're being obedient to Jesus. But what if, That one statement stirs something in his heart or her heart. Let's just make this more dramatic. Let's just say this, let's make it a woman and say she's a single mom at home with her child. And and all of a sudden, God begins to do something in her heart. And that next Sunday, she says, you know what? Maybe I need to go back to church. And she takes her child and she goes to church and they start going to church and their lives get changed. Maybe that child grows up and becomes a follower of Jesus and says, you know what, God's calling me to go to Africa. And maybe he goes to Africa. And maybe he gets there, and maybe he reaches one person and he dies. But that one person becomes a reason why hundreds of thousands of people in Africa come to know Jesus. Let's take that story back. Hundreds of thousands of people come to know Jesus because one person gets saved by this missionary that moved from um, Texas, and that missionary um, became a missionary because his mom took him to church every week. And the reason his mom took him to church was because one day on a Sunday after church, a family said, hey, how can I pray for you? And God began to stir in their heart a desire to follow Jesus. You have no idea the impact your life will have if you will be obedient to Jesus in the little things of life. God's not calling you to do big things. God's calling you to today just be faithful, be obedient. Some of you are saying, what is God's plan for me? Trust and obey. What is God's plan for me? What is God's desire for me? How how is God going to use me? Just be obedient. Just love the people that he's put around you. Point them toward Jesus and the actions that you do. And if you work up the courage to invite someone to church where the gospel is preached, it might lead to a new life, which might turn to, into a redeemed family, which might lead to a generation or two from now, a world being changed. You have no idea, but live it as if that could happen. 
You folks that are investing in our children week in and week out, teaching them in kids' church, telling them Bible stories in nursery, discipling them in teens' Bible study, praying with them, answering their questions. You have no way of knowing what God is going to do through these kids. And whether in their generation or a generation after, the world is changed because of your faithfulness in the small things of life today. The same is true when you offer a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, when you visit a prisoner in Jesus' name, when you care for the poor in Jesus' name. The little that we do, we have no idea the impact it has for the glory of God. Isn't it funny that 90% of the things that we thought were so important 10 years ago are forgotten today? And most likely, 90% of the things that we feel are so important today will be forgotten 10 years from now. And yet, our trust and obedience, our acts of surrender, our willingness to serve can be shaped by God in the same way he used the choices of this very ordinary couple by the name of Boaz and Ruth to change the world. Friends, you have no idea, uh, you have no way of knowing what your future holds, but we know who holds the future. God can use ordinary people who are yielded grateful, engaged, who step into good works that he has prepared for us to accomplish his saving purposes. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he could use you? Do you believe that today that he could possibly use you to impact many people? There are two wonderful lessons from this last section of Ruth. One is that you could either grow in grace or you can be captured by grace. But either way, grace is so much bigger than all of us. The second is that simple, obedient, yielded, honest, caring people who can't see significance in themselves, their world, or their choices can be picked by the hand of God to create a future to change the world. Your life can make a difference. And you might not know about it till you stand before Jesus one day. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. I'm always tempted to tell my high school friend of the story of how she's impacted my life. I pro- it'll probably encourage her, but I'd love for her to stand in front of Jesus one day and say, you know, you being faithful, let a man to follow Jesus. He's planted a church. He's traveled the world all because of your faithful obedience at the ages of 14, 15, 16, 17. And I'd love to see the awe and shock on her face when that happens. And I don't know, but I think that's going to be the same for a lot of you as well. Your simple daily obedience to Jesus. You'd be like, I lived, I died, I was buried. But Jesus says, no, no your daily faithful obedience made an impact. Now, friends, history is not a collection of one wretched thing after another going nowhere. David, the offspring of Jesus, was and is Israel's greatest, most celebrated king. He was a military hero. He was a shepherd, a songwriter, Scripture says that he was a man after God's own heart. He, God said that one of his sons would sit on the throne forever. All of this comes to fulfillment in Jesus. He is the greater David. The people would, in Jerusalem would say of Jesus that, Hosanna to the son of David. The apostle Paul would say that Jesus ascended from David. And when you flip over to Matthew 1, you see a genealogy one that doesn't end with David, but one that ends with David's greater son, Jesus. The story of Ruth is so important because it reminds that history is moving us toward the worship of Jesus, who is the root and descendant of David. Matthew begins his genealogy, and he includes individuals like Tamar, who we talked about before, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. Rahab and Ruth are outsiders. 
They don't belong in the family of God. Tamar and Bathsheba have, are associated with sinful sexual sin. They don't belong in the genealogy of Jesus. David is listed there, and he's an adulterer and a murderer. The entire genealogy of Jesus includes men, women, prostitutes, adulterers, liars, murderers, Jews, Gentiles. And he's telling us, that, listen, Jesus has come into this world to save sinners like them and like you and I. If you're a Christian, realize that these are not just people in history. These are your people. This is your story. You can add your name to that list. The grace of God is greater than the greatness of your sin. The grace of God is greater than whatever you've done or whatever you ever will do. God has provided the Savior that you need. Listen to these words in Matthew 1. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel which is translated God with us. Back in Ruth, we read about the need of a redeemer, a refuge, a rest, and how Ruth took refuge under the wings of the Almighty God. We read about the struggles of Naomi. She thought that God was against her, and at the end of the story, she realizes that God had not forgotten her. Friends, as glorious as the story of Ruth is, we're told in Matthew 1 that God has not just not forgotten us, but God is with us. God is with us. By placing your faith in Jesus, your ultimate refuge, your ultimate rest, your ultimate peace, he has come come to give rest to the weary, sick, and sore. John Wesley, the great preacher, on his dying deathbed, he said, the best of all, God is with me. Matthew begins with the assurance of his presence with us, but the book of Matthew closes with these words from Jesus. He says, I will always be with you. I'll always be with you. It's an already promise for those of you who have trusted in Jesus through the Holy Spirit, but it's also a not yet promise. For one day, this promise will come to climatic fulfillment in the new heavens and the new earth. John tells us that God will dwell with us. We will be his people. God will be with us as our God. He will wipe every tear from our eyes, and he will make all things new. How would Jesus appear in human history, providing this grace, peace, and joy for sinners? Matthew tells us that a virgin would conceive that a more significant son would be born in Bethlehem with an even more remarkable birth. birth. Remember the idea of God intervening in the lives of barren women so that they would have significant children? Just prior to the birth of Jesus, we read about the story of John the Baptist. Elizabeth was barren, but the Lord sent an angel to tell her husband Zechariah that Elizabeth will bear a son by God's intervention. John would prepare the way for the Messiah. In all these significant conceptions in redemptive history, women like Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel, Ruth, Hannah, Elizabeth, they prepare us for the most significant one of all, the birth of Jesus. The previous mothers were barren, but Mary is a virgin. Jesus' birth was the most climatic conception of all time, a conception not in the womb of a barren woman, but the womb womb of a virgin. The genealogy of Matthew, you might say, shows us the human nature of God, but the virgin birth magnifies his divine nature. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, united in one person. It's the mystery of the incarnation, the word become flesh, the glory of Christmas. Galatians says it this way, when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent his spirit into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son And if a son, God has made you an heir. Friends, Boaz was an amazing redeemer. David was an extraordinary king. But Jesus is unique. 
He's the only one in that God-man category. He's the only one that's fully qualified to redeem us. He's the only one that can save us from our sins. He's the only one that can make us his beloved. And he's the only one who can give us such a glorious inheritance. We celebrate Jesus. This moment, in a few moments, we're headed to communion. As we come to this table, we're reminded that Jesus wasn't just born. Jesus being born and dying would make another great story. But Jesus was born, he lived, he died, he was buried, resurrected, so that you and I could be part of the family of God. And when we come to the table this morning, we remember the finished work of Jesus. We remember that on the cross 2,000 years ago that he willingly gave up his life so that you and I could be part of the family of God. We take the bread that represents the body that was broken. We drink the juice that represents the blood that was spilled, never forgetting that our salvation wasn't anything that we had done or anything that we had accomplished, being reminded week in and week out that we are saved, not because of our works or our righteousness, but because of the pure kindness and goodness and grace of Jesus in our lives. So we come to the table with nothing to boast other than to say, God, thank you for saving me. God, thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for your grace that either captured me or helped me to grow in it. Thank you that you've never stopped giving up on me. Thank you. So would you take a moment? Would you meditate? Would you spend some time with Jesus? Would you reflect on his grace in your life? Would you thank him that he has never given up? And as you come to the table this morning, would you come with joy and gratitude for his salvation in your life and what he's done? Father, we thank you for this story, the story of Ruth. We thank you that you took an outsider and you made her a part of the family of God. We thank you that you still take outsiders and you make them part of the family of God. We thank you that your grace has not given up on us. We thank you that your grace will pursue us and capture us, that your grace is greater than all our sins. As we come to the table, we know it's simply because of your grace that we can come. And so we come thanking you this morning.